I'm Adrian Johnstone. I'm a professor at Royal Holloway. Um, I'm going to shift the level of discourse away from how the individual programs work. Can you hear me now? Yes. How the individual programs work and indeed how the individual machines work because my interest is in really how the machines came to be. How were those individual designs captured and marshaled together into these very complex objects? So um, my main goal is to help you get some insight into the diagram that is behind the figure wheel there which captures a description of the causal chain within the printer which was designed both for the analytical engine and for difference engine number two and that physical printer you can go and view in the science museum. Now because I stand between you and lunch and uh, we're clearly overrunning, I'm going to show my last slide first <laughs> because it, it contains an invitation. Um, uh, Elizabeth Scott and I uh, have a table set up outside which has got this device on it and you're very welcome to come and play with it because it will add together your two favourite numbers as long as they are single digit numbers <laughs> and uh, it, is, it is a direct representation of the adder mechanism from difference engine number two which is related to the kinds of uh, adding mechanisms that would have been used in the analytical engine. And we can explain to you how it works and you can have a play with it. So why don't you come and talk to us. We'll be there in the breaks both today and tomorrow. There's plenty of opportunity. Uh, if I'm allowed, I'll even bring it along and have it on the table at dinner this evening. Okay, so now let me get on to what I really want to talk about. <clears throat> now, I'm, uh, I'll leave this up there for you to read while I'm speaking. Uh, I study uh, formal languages. That means languages which are more or less mathematically specified, both their syntax and their semantics. Now, in practice, that means programming languages, it means mathematical symbolism, it means some aspects of network protocols, and it means, in particular, a curious byway in the field of formal languages, which are hardware description languages. Now, hardware description languages are little known, but are incredibly important, because our modern technology really rests on the achievement of hardware description languages. A modern high-end integrated circuit has on it one transistor for every person on this planet. Now, anybody who hears that for the first time and is, is not shocked, is not paying attention. <laughs> How on earth could you possibly marshal the geometry and the interconnections in a structure which is as complex as the population of the planet? How do you do that? And hardware description languages are how you do it. You use techniques from software engineering where we use hierarchy and abstraction to enable the designer to focus on a particular part of the machine, a particular level of the machine at any one time. And you use, also use new ideas, ideas which I call faceting, in that what we do is we bring together multiple descriptions of the same piece of hardware, its interconnectivity, its geometry, it, the intent of its behavior, and we have these things in parallel, and the hardware description language works so as to enable you to check the uh, internal consistency of those descriptions. Now, the use of hardware description languages is quite recent. When I started as a young academic in the uh, mid-1980s, it was still something that you had to persuade hardcore electronic engineers to do, because they could still just about cope with the complexity of the systems they were designing by drawing pictures. But those, uh, 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 th that battle was won, and these days I think almost nobody designs high-end hardware without using a hardware description language. As an aside, one of the two dominant hardware description languages called VHDL is derived from the language called ADA, which you will hear about a little bit this afternoon. It's just a little historical accident. So the thing that is interesting is that Charles Babbage, as well as being the pioneer of computing, as well as being an embryonic figure in economics, as well as all the other strange rocks that you lift, and there is Babbage smiling at you, this <laughs> anachronistic figure, he invented hardware description languages. And I don't think this is a widely known fact, uh, which is great for me because it enabled me to extract a very large amount of money from the Leverhulme Trust to run a research project on this topic. <laughs> It is clear that Babbage was fixated on notation throughout his life. We don't have time to do biographies of uh, Babbage here, but um, Dubby has it here. The, 
the Leibnizian notation that we use for uh, uh, differential calculus essentially is, is in our current usage because Babbage went to war with the authorities at Cambridge as an undergraduate, and that battle was won very quickly. So notation was always central to Babbage's ideas. Now, writing 80 or 90 years after this picture of Babbage was taken, Bertrand Russell said something quite interesting. It's a commonplace that ordinary language is too ambiguous to enable us to specify electronic and mathematical systems. But Russell makes the very excellent point that only mathematics and mathematical logic can say as little as the physicist needs to say. This idea that what we're going to do is strip meaning out of symbols so as to deliver precision and insight is absolutely at the heart of what we do in mathematics and in computing and in all other forms of it, um, all other forms of engineering. Now, for the folk in the audience who are not engineering and mathematical orient, mathematically oriented, I want to make absolutely clear that this has got nothing to do with linguistic relativism. Concepts which were satirized so ably by Orwell in 1984. I, it's always seemed to me that anybody that reads that paragraph, this is a quote from Syme, the figure in 1984, explaining what new speak is for. Anybody who reads that and doesn't think it's nonsense isn't paying attention because the fecundity with which humans create words and terminology is outstanding. I'm sure you can create a language where people won't say out loud anything that the thought police won't come after you for, but the idea that you could actually erase modes of thought by restricting people's vocabulary, I think is bizarre, and fortunately, I think is not a, co a common, uh, not, a, not a commonly supported mode in natural ling linguistics at the moment. <clears throat> Orwell himself wrote uh, a couple of years previously uh, in almost opposite terms. I have to be very careful about saying things like this because linguists are famous for the viciousness of their debates and I, don't want to, I do not wish to have any bricks thrown at my head and uh, as Pinker says, he, you wouldn't believe the kind of hate mail he gets just from his work on irregular verbs. So I'm keeping right off human linguistics. The only reason for putting this slide up is to tell you that I am not talking about linguistic relativism. I'm talking about something different. Now, the project that I mentioned earlier comprises these four folk here, and I want to give uh, full acknowledgement to them. Doran Swade on the end there. I met Doran 25 years ago when I turned up at the Science Museum to hear about efforts in the conservation of early computers, and he and I worked together on a variety of projects. And inter alia, he showed me the Difference Engine, which was under construction at that time, and began to talk to me about Babbage's work. And for me, the central question was, what? How can this possibly be? Anybody who encounters Babbage's work for the first time with our perspective from the 20th century and isn't shocked isn't paying attention. And they should be shocked for two reasons. Firstly, because the machinery exists, and secondly, because it does not connect through to our technology. Doran has this glorious phrase. He calls Babbage the great uncle of computing. There's this notion of something really important going on over there, but there is no descendant connection to the current generation of children. It is astonishing. As much that Babbage's machines existed, it is, as, it is astonishing that the stuff disappeared again. And the study that we're doing does throw a little bit of insight onto why that is so. So the people in the team, there's Doran at the end, there's some weird guy there um, in a sweatshirt, Professor Elizabeth Scott, who you can meet outside, and Dr. Piers Plummer, who is a very fine mechanical and electronic engineer who has designed and built some of the alternate babagery systems that we're playing with as part of our project. Now, I want to show you some timelines and just skitter through some of the machines so that you can get a feel for them. The reason I like to put this slide up is because it is a common place that Babbage is this anachronistic Victorian engineer. He's no such thing. He's an anachronistic Georgian engineer. This is not Victorian engineering. This is Georgian engineering. By the time Victoria concedes to mount the throne, the whole Difference Engine 1 project has been and gone. Work on the analytical engine has begun. The concepts and the ideas that we've been talking about today are already well in place. The the other thing I want to draw to your attention is that Babbage had a son to whom, well, he had several sons. We'll come to that in a moment. He bequeathed his equipment and much of his knowledge, and Henry Provost Babbage continued his work after Babbage's death, really right up to the First World War. So this is really a very, very long development program indeed that we're talking about. 50 years of Babbage and then more years of the son. 
It's not clear that the sun really moved things forward anymore. He did a few things that are important. He constructed some small test pieces, much like the one that I can show you outside and let you play with, in conception at least. And they were distributed to major institutions of learning. There's one in the Oxford History of, the, uh, History of Science. One went to Harvard, and one is sitting on a plinth at the moment in the Science Museum in London where difference engine number one normally lives because DE1 has been moved upstairs for the Ada exhibition. So if you're in London, you can go and have a look at one. <clears throat> the other thing I want to draw your attention to is the relative timing of the pieces of work. Now, difference engine number one is a project that failed. It failed not because the engineering was impossible, but perhaps because the engineering organisation was beyond what was possible for the time, or possibly because Babbage was being ripped off. Discuss, not my job. <laughs> it failed, but immediately thereafter, Babbage's vision expanded towards generalisations of the polynomial computation that the difference engine does. It's clear that Babbage was haunted by the failure of that early project. And towards the middle of the analytical engine development, Babbage re-implemented the same architecture, probably the first example in history of a range of machines where an architecture has two physical manifestations. So Fred Brooks move over. Um, he re-implemented the difference engine architecture using the new ideas and technology that he developed whilst thinking about the analytical engine. And the headline result is that the number of parts goes down by a factor three. So the complete difference engine number one, around about 24,000 parts. Difference engine number two, about 8,000 parts. The analytical engine, well, put a wet finger in the air, how many registers do you want? You see these numbers are quite large. They're not as large as the population of the planet, but I don't know how good you are at holding the details of 24,000 things in your head at once. It's an extraordinary intellectual achievement. How was it done? Let's skip through some material very quickly. I want to just, uh, because I'm going to talk about collaboration in a moment, I want to talk briefly about Babbage's character. You see here the list of Babbage's children with their births and deaths. It's not a happy story. By 1827, five of Babbage's children and his wife were dead. That's going to do something to a man. And I think having an enormous project to throw yourself into for decades might possibly be a side effect of that kind of hand that fate has dealt you. We can talk very briefly about what the difference engine does. It kind of does that. There's an Excel sheet, and I've done a quadratic, actually a cubic fit to some data. It's the data from one of our research algorithms. You probably know that you can take equations which are made up of powers of x, and if you do it carefully enough, you can fit them to most other equations that you might be interested in, so trigonometric functions and so on. And the way that these machines were used was to get a, get a competent mathematician to do a piecewise fit of polynomials to the function you actually wanted to compute. And then the difference engine, using a method of Newton's, enables you to tabulate the values of that polynomial simply by performing repeated additions or subtractions, depending on how you care to think about it. And that's what the difference engines do. They are both very limited and yet very, very useful because not so much of the utility of polynomials, but the fact that you can fit polynomials so easily to the functions that you want. <clears throat> Here is difference engine number one. Doran has already shown this. The reason I'm showing you these slides is so that you can look at the progression in the physical manifestation of the parts. This, Georgian engineering, definitely Georgian engineering, all finished before Victoria came along, rather beautiful, rather baroque and curvaceous in places. This is difference engine number two, which is much more in your face. It's a lot bigger for a start. Remember, this has got a third as many parts as the earlier engine. The earlier engine, that's only a fragment, about a seventh of it, so you've got to do a bit of arithmetic in your head. But this is a much chunkier piece of kit. Just for your information, the section on the end here is the printer, and we're going to talk about that again in a moment. I've thrown a picture of the Rosetta Stone in there as well, courtesy of Wikimedia Commons. The reason I've done that is because for our project, this is our Rosetta Stone. Every time people talk about Babbage, they say, oh, of course, he never finished anything. Ha, ha, ha. Go to hell is my response. This man, this man did incredible things. One thing he did finish was the design for DE2, and he offered it to the government, and the government said, oh, no, thank you, because they got burnt pretty badly on DE1. 
But the presence of the full design enabled Doran and his team in, 19, in the run-up to 1990 to construct this physical machine. This is not a reconstruction, this is a first construction. But they did it purely by reference to the engineering diagrams, and they didn't use the notational elements that I'm going to describe to you in a moment. <clears throat> As a result, we have this physical artifact and we have these notations independently, and we can use the physical artifact to decode the notations. So this is kind of linear B for early computing. Finally, we have the analytical engine, or one version of it, and this is much more lightly constructed. It's a much smaller system. Apart from all the other things he did, Babbage became interested in manufacturing technology and took a tour of the country and wrote a book on it, which was cited by Karl Marx in uh, Das Kapital because it was one of the first studies of what was possible in manufacturers. <clears throat> so what you see here, in fact, is a, a, a third generation of engineering hardware. It would be very interesting to see what the difference engine would look like if it was constructed using this style of hardware. Before I show you the notational stuff proper, I want to talk to you about the nature of collaboration because it's about the only thing I have to say about Ada. Now, the first thing you must understand is that all engineering design is really a conversation between the designers, the artifact, and the users. Designers are always surprised by what their things actually do. Sometimes they do weird stuff because you made a mistake. Sometimes they do weird stuff because they've got capabilities that you hadn't imagined. Never less true than of computing. Nearly all systems are unfinished. They're simply abandoned because people moved on. And really the only distinction between designers, implementers and users is about the level of abstraction that they're working in. Now this is something I feel fairly keenly because I work in various collaborative relationships, none of which are comfortable. They're all necessary to drive forward the ideas, but it's not a fun sport. Anybody who's got a very comfortable, cheerful, collaborative relationship probably needs somebody with a bit more grit in there. And I think one of the tragedies of Babbage is that he didn't have any users. Apart from that brief supernova explosion, as Doran talks of it, maybe nine months in one year in the middle of a 50-year research program, basically you can see Babbage working alone with a team of technicians to implement his ideas, <clears throat> essentially in isolation, not lecturing about what he's doing, and really somewhat resistant even to getting the stuff published and out the door. He's independently wealthy, why does he care? He's not sitting in a modern university with a ref coming up to bite his backside in five minutes time. <laughs> so now I'm gonna get into the actual technical core of what I'm gonna do, but very briefly, because there's very little time, but you can come and talk to me afterwards. Here's a close up of the printer mechanism. The printer, in many ways, is more, the most complex part of the machine. It does, um, it, it, it does different width columns, for instance. And one feature that I can draw to your attention is that as you're printing a set of tables, the man on the other end is turning the handle. It's all probably a man. The person on the other end is turning the handle. You can see this in the video. They don't know when you've got to the bottom of a table. So there's actually a mechanism whereby a trip is thrown by the printer and there is a cat-gut cord which runs across the machine and disengages a drive dog in the handle, at which point you're running free and the machine itself is stopped. So there's this glorious synchronization mechanism in there. I understand that the West Coast version has a bit of trouble here because cat gut is hydroscopic, I was told this morning, so it stretches. <laughs> Thank you for the anecdote. Now then, if you go and look at the engineering diagrams for the printer, you see a traditional side-on view of the gears as you've got at the back there. But it's also uh, heavily populated with strange symbols. And here are some in close-up. You can see that there are letters in different fonts, and they have a variety of subscripts and superscripts. This is the core of Babbage's notation, and it is how he managed to make sense of the complexity of his system. This is what it looks like in toto. This is a trains diagram, one of three facets of Babbage's hardware description language, and it captures the causal chains throughout the printer. You can't see it terribly well, so I'm going to zoom it up, zoom up a little bit on one of the central features, and you'll begin to see what's going on. There are these rather strange-looking formulae. We see here these labels with actually up to six suffices. We see these braces and we see arrows, and we see parentheses, and they all mean something. Now here's the kicker. Babbage was 
by his own words, most proud of the notation. He saw it as his greatest achievement, and of course he was correct, because this is not a machine. This is, this is not a program running on a machine. This is a way of thinking which enables you to design machines. This is not the thing, this is the meta thing. And the meta thing is always more interesting than the thing. And Babbage was absolutely correct, I think, in saying that his hardware description language was the pinnacle of his intellectual achievement, not least of all because it enabled everything else. And it went nowhere. As far as anyone can see, apart from a few of his technicians and his son, nobody really used this notation in anger. Now, why would that be? Well, I think the answer is very simple. Babbage was so far out of his time in terms of the state space of the machinery that he was building that no one else needed it. If you look at a steam engine, which I build in my copious free time, or even an internal combustion engine, there is state, there are cycles, there is rotation, but there's nothing that you can't figure out just by looking at a side elevation and imagining the bits moving around. It's only when you introduce memory into a system, it's only when you introduce state that things get too hard. And essentially, you don't find machines with true state appearing until Zeus are perhaps in the 30s and certainly the post-World War II flowering in computing. And I think it's exactly how big is the state space of your machine. And if it isn't too big to fit in your head, you might have a go at this. Anybody else is going to run screaming from this. <laughs> and they did. Babbage tried to push this as a notation that should be taught in the mechanical schools. And in fact, at the time of the Great Exhibition, he made a desultory attempt to contact people who might be interested in it and try and generalise his notation in a certain way to give it wider applicability. It's one of the few instances that one can see of Babbage reaching out to other folks and saying, come and join with me. <laughs> Doesn't it? Remember what happened to APL? <laughs> a very, very fine notation, which is not broadly used outside of certain shops. Here's some detail on how it works. Names comprise a letter and the font and whether it's in italics or not are significant. Above it, there's a little icon, which is called the index of form. That particular one is a rack. I'll show you some other ones in a moment. Down the bottom, there's an icon indicating the kind of movement that the element named by this name performs. So that motion there is actually the motion of something that is turning if you're looking down the x-axis. So actually, that's the motion of the handle on the end of difference engine number two. The index of identity is set to be the same for all elements that are rigidly connected. The index of alphabet is used when, you're run, when you've run out of letters <laughs> and, and doesn't appear. So six was enough for a long time and then it wasn't enough. The linear index is used to generate arrays. You will have seen in the example that Doran showed this morning a sigma and something that looks suspiciously like an indexed expression from a software programming language. That's exactly what it is and it referred to the columns in the difference engine number two. And the angular index does the same thing, but it's used for rotation. Any of you that have seen the uh, difference engine in action will know that it has a spiral of levers behind it. So each element both goes up and rotates by a certain angle. And that's, that's the angular index. <clears throat> Not used very often because those structures don't appear very much. Here are some, I, I love these. Here are some of the icons that Babbage constructed. My favourite one is the escapement. So he, he, he gave an example of a clock written in the notation. You know how the escapement works. And there's a little pendulum. And when I said earlier that around about the time of the Great Exhibition, he attempted to reach out to other people, what he actually did was say to people, what other icons do I need? What other kinds of mechanisms are there? And there are about 70 or 80 of these little pictures. This one's a rack. Well, you get the idea. They're all meant to be, have mnemonic value. <clears throat> And the motions, too, have some mnemonic value. Coming from a modern perspective, when you look at it, you find that there are obvious gaps and lacunae all over the place. Some motions down some axes have an icon and some don't. So from, to a modern mathematician, a modern, somebody who's interested in modern formal languages, one of the very interesting things is that Babbage just seems to have used what he needed and not even bothered to define the rest of it. Which I guess from a mathematician's perspective makes sense, but from an engineer's perspective is confusing. There's some information on the naming conventions and whether we're upright or slanted letters. You can read about all this stuff. I'm, how much long have I got? Have I run out of time completely? Oh, you're waving your hands. You have a sign saying stop in front of you, but I cannot tell whether it's active or not. <laughs> you wave it at me, really. Can I keep going for a bit? Okay. <laughs> right, so here, here are some of the conventions. 
Some of the conventions are desperately unhelpful. On a particular drawing, the lettering of parts is such that, where does it say here? Um, letter names are used to indicate depth into the diagram. So a distant part has a letter closer to the beginning of the alphabet, which is really great right up until the point when you've got the same part on two different diagrams from two different angles. So these names are with respect to a particular diagram to some extent. There is cross-referencing. I don't want to underestimate that. But again, from a modern perspective, we would think of the part having a name which popped up with the same name in various places. And here there is, life is not so simple, necessarily. One of the things that Babbage does, which though is absolutely core and really important, is that he distinguishes between working parts and working points. Now, he calls them working points, but in general they might be a surface. So a cam is a part, and a cam follower is a part. The place where they contact each other, which in general is a surface, that's a working point. And for the computer scientists in the audience, essentially what Babbage is doing is constructing a directed graph of the hardware interactions. So we can think of the trains diagram as a description of a connected directed graph whose nodes form two classes, pieces, those are the physical objects, and action points. And edges are also in two classes. There are ownership edges, which say this piece belongs to this assembly. And there are um, uh, and, and there are uh, cause arrows which involve an action point to action point arrangement. So the graph is not as you might imagine that the nodes in the graph are the parts and the edges of the interactions and they're labelled. Not at all. There are nodes for the interactions which have lines between them. This is hard, actually. It's really quite hard to think about. Here are some examples that are derived from a paper written by Henry Provost Babbage, so I'm doing a bit of an ADA here. I haven't invented my own stuff. I've nicked it from another paper. The, um, these are the examples here. So we've got a bevel gear here, which is rotating the one at the top there and driving the bottom bevel gear. Now, 3P, 3B, and 3D are all rigidly connected to each other. That's what the three means. The letters tell you that those are individual pieces. And this strange formula up here, which can be compressed to here, tells you that there is motion or force being injected via 3B, which is turning 3B, and as outputs has 3D and 3B up there. Here's a related example. It's essentially the same structure. There's a sleeve rotating on an axle. In this case, the axle is called 3P, and everything else is called 2D and 2P, because they're now independently non-fixed elements. And again, if I drive it, then 2B is driving 3P, and the parentheses mean it's rotating around that axle. Okay, you begin to see why the mechanicians of the day might not have enjoyed this very much. It's actually quite hard to use. This is why I borrowed examples from Henry Provost. Okay, I'm now being told to shut up. That's fine. One last slide. We're building software simulations, as you might expect of this stuff, and we're building 3D printed systems, and there's one there for you to come and play at. Okay, we're done. Thank you very much for your attention.